Okay, so uh, the reason for this uh, meeting was that uh, you know I was I was giving the background to, to those of you who are new to CDPP. The background was that uh, a couple of years ago we were looking at this study, this one. Uh, and I think you've seen this. So uh, this was a question that uh, that we were being asked especially at a place where I teach, which is the Mari Channa Reddy Institute, uh, where we teach uh, you know, the bureaucracy. Asim is there, Ilanjan, you are there. Uh, and uh, the question that often used to come up was that why did Hyderabad, how did Hyderabad transform itself? Why did one sleepy little town become the IT hub of the country? And so we went and you know, dug deep into that issue and tried to answer that question asking people who are in that sector uh, what makes Hyderabad, you know. And one of those, uh, one of the answers, Maitri, was, uh, was A.S. Rao. <laughs> the A.S. Rao, you know. And that A.S. Rao was one of the founders of uh, India's IT and because of his ECIL thing. So, you know, there, were, there is a legacy, there is an industrial thing, there is something that comes from the Nizam times with a focus on industry, the industrial hubs outside Hyderabad, the industrial exhibition, setting up of the public sector. So you could, we could trace a uh, thing as to why Hyderabad becomes an IT hub. It's a very fascinating study. It also, and we looked into every aspect. So a good education system, uh, the geography, the history of the place, the role of the government, role of the private sector of foreign investment and very importantly the role of the bureaucracy there was you know the and the technocrat so we brought in all that and this made for us a great experience in studying this the other question therefore then we that we have been uh, grappling with <coughs> is quite a parallel but an even bigger issue which is why how does a dusty brown arid state, even 10 years ago, turn into one of the greenest states in the country? Why does a state that, depend on, that depends on rice imports forever, now is the rice, rice bowl of the country? Uh, how did that transformation take? And this transformation we have seen, you know, as you drive out from Hyderabad and come back, you see that, you know, one crop has become three crops. Uh, there's water everywhere, all the reservoirs where we used to drive our cars and motorcycles into. Now, you know, you need big ships, <laughs> and in the, including the Gandhi Pet where sometimes I go to. It's full of water in April. So how did that happen? And that's the question that we are, that we were looking at. And that is why uh, when I had this conversation with Raghu, uh, it was, it, it, it drove his interest as to look at these answers. So the final person I have to introduce you to is Raghunandan Rao. Raghu, uh, apart from being a very dear old friend, we went to Masuri together. Uh, but Raghu has been uh, shepherding this in Telangana for quite some time now. Uh, in uh, Having worked in the combined state, but since Telangana has been here and he has been the Secretary of Agriculture uh, and Cooperatives. and. So, so the request was that uh, Raghu gives us a broad oversight on how this transformation has taken place. What were the, what were the policy reasons? What were the inputs that went in? What drove this change? What were the challenges that uh, that the government faced? And you know, the money. You know, it's, it's huge amounts of money that went in. So, how did, how much, how did, how was that coordinated? And what does it mean for the? future of the state. Uh, the idea is the same. The idea is to understand this transformation. There is, for some of us, there is this, uh, so the, the, the purpose was that, you know, how do we understand this and, and, and like I was mentioning Siraj Hussain who was the Secretary of Agriculture, Government of India. Um, he once hinted at this, he said that, is there a Telangana model of uh, agriculture? like a Kerala model of healthcare or a Tamil Nadu model of, uh, pro of, of procurement. Can there be, and you know, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, uh, there seems to be something like this. We haven't yet done enough to, to put a stamp on that. 
uh, we haven't done enough to look at all these innovations in policy. Raitu Bandhu is a Telangana policy and now it's a nationwide thing. So where did that come from? So that's the purpose and that's why, you know, it's so nice of all of you to join this uh, discussion uh, so that we can explore these questions in some detail. So the structure is that I give it over to Raghu to do a, do, Raghu just a, just take us through that story and then some questions at the end. There are some people who are who are joining us online, so they might also have some questions. Uh, is that okay? We'll, 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 we'll break at five, so so we won't hold you for too long. Yeah, thank you, Amir. Thank you to all of you for uh, taking time off on a hot, hot, very hot uh, afternoon. <coughs> yeah, so um, I think I can leave it here. Yeah, just leave it. It's just for the for the zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's a it's a really. Um, fascinating story of what has happened to agriculture in Telangana over the last uh, eight years, nine years, uh, and why it has happened and uh, what drove those uh, changes. But before that, I think we need to go back to what was the situation of agriculture uh, in the 1990s, uh, 2000, in that decade. Uh, one can guess that uh, uh, right from the time of the Kakatiyas, this, this area would have been a uh, agriculturally vibrant area. Um, the Telangana that we have now has roughly about 10,000 revenue villages. But we have around 10,000 revenue villages okay. and around 12,000 gram panchayats. Uh, but we have around 40,000 tanks. How many gram panchayats? 12,744 gram panchayats and around 40,000 tanks. So given the topography uh, of the area, the right, it, I think it was a legacy of the Kakatiyas that uh, they developed a series of tanks which, uh, which was the basis for agriculture in this area in the, in the past. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 40,000 tanks, is it the latest figure that that's what you're quoting? Yeah. And uh, was it built as part of Narendra or? No, no, no. This must, this must, this must, must yeah. okay. See, the, the way the topography of the area is that if you build a small, uh, uh, a small, Change yeah, dam, miles. then the water normally stops. Okay. So uh, I come from a small village about uh, 80, 90 kilometers. We had three tanks in our village. No. And uh, even at that time, the total area of that uh, village must have been around 1,000 acres. Still, we had uh, three tanks. So the, yeah, Cheruvu, Kunta, uh, those kind of things. So this was the basis for the Telangana's uh, agriculture uh, till 50s, 60s, 70s. Now, what happened uh, after uh, in the after 50s, 60s, 70s is uh, we started investing a lot on heavy irrigation projects, Nagarjun Sagar, Sri Salem, and, and all those projects that were built. And then even within the government, we started categorizing this as major irrigation, medium irrigation, and minor irrigation structures. So these kind of village tanks sort of became minor irrigation structures. They were minor, they were called minor because they had small areas to irrigate. But in Telangana's context, they were, they were actually the lifeline. But because of continuous neglect, the water carrying capacity of all these tanks uh, reduced drastically. And we, the farmers of Telangana started relying on bore wells. The difference between tank and bore well for the farmer is, tank water, he doesn't invest in the capital. It, it more or less comes free to him, he has to pay only a small water says. Whereas with bore well, you have to invest in the bore well. And then it, also depends on the power supply. So the power supply also became a significant factor for farmers of uh, Telangana. Uh, and that is why uh, when the power tariffs were increased in 99-2000, it led to an agitation. Yeah. It, led, it led to firing actually, it led to agitation and a firing. And uh, uh, so this, this uh, and then uh, if you look at the newspapers in 1999, 2000, and in those times, you will see uh, you will see news of farmers uh, raiding substations to ensure power supply. Okay, 
then in the towns and villages you will see hundreds of shops uh, dealing with transformers then uh, the farmers of that area had to save their crops by ensuring that the transformer gets power supply and therefore politically also ensuring power supply or free power supply became a manifesto promise and that's how the 2004 election also was one of the significant things that we will provide six hours of uh, free hours of, of supply to the agricultural sector so water and power became the critical uh, things and that is why during the telangana movement uh, those of us who have lived here know that the tagline of the telangana movement was nilu nidulu and niyamakalu nilu means water nidulu means funds and niyamakalu means jobs okay so water for irrigation was really one of the emotional backbones of the telangana movement so if telangana movement captured the imagination of the people living in these areas then i think water for irrigation was one of the significant things that once we have a known state we will get uh, water so if you look at the data the area under tank irrigation between 1950s to uh, let us say 2000 came down by nearly 10 lakh acres and that was replaced by by nearly 10 lakh acres and it Yeah, it must have been around 30, 35 lakh acres. I mean, there was also bore wells and all that, but water under uh, irrigation. Yeah, so th that was the uh, situation. So after Telangana was formed, uh, I think government uh, tried to look at uh, ensuring water supply to uh, water for irrigation as one of its primary objectives. So in the In, within 6 months after the formation of the state mission kakatiya was taken up mission kakatiya was basically a project to restore the water bodies in rural telangana 27 mission kakatiya kakatiya mission kakatiya uh, was basically it, it was uh, funded by nabard it was an radf uh, loan uh, around uh, 56 no no 27000 tanks were uh, taken up under mission kakatiya in a phase manner of 3 years okay and i think around 16 to 17000 crores was spent on this uh, project basically to restore the carrying capacity of every tank okay so the foreshore area was cleaned the bunds were uh, strengthened the spill uh, the spillover works were uh, improved so that uh, the area under the tanks could be uh, stabilized um this thing thing was also done okay mm -hmm. so all these things were done so that uh, the tanks uh, could uh, stabilize but more than that what we should realize is that uh, telangana has two rivers krishna and godavari okay uh, krishna uh, we have we krishna basin as such uh, we it, it takes care of southern part of telangana but basically the water comes to us from the river comes to us from karnataka and then there are low, lower riparian rights created for andhra pradesh already and krishna river by itself is an over exploited basin krishna basin itself is an over exploited basin on the other hand godavari there is lot of potential because lot of water from godavari goes into the bay of bengal every year around 6 to 7000 uh, tmc of water it is estimated goes into uh, bay of bengal every year so godavari around around 6 to 7000 uh, tmc of water goes large amount of water uh, drains into the bay of bengal now the way the uh, telangana topography is it is something like this okay the river godavari flows like this krishna flows on this side and around hyderabad is the rich point okay so godavari most parts of where it skirts telangana is flowing at around 80 to 100 meters above mean sea level hyderabad is around 600 meters above mean sea level so if you need to get water from godavari to our areas then the only way is to lift it the only way is to lift it so uh, so the government had to make a strategic choice whether we will go for a lift irrigation project of this magnitude 
and i think that choice was made much before telangana was formed under the pranahita chevella project which was already under some kind of conception some investments had happened but basically the pick up point was moved to ensure that uh, we have sufficient supply of water at wherever you are going to pick the water from in godavari and then uh, the in investments were done in this the world's largest uh, lift irrigation project which is kaleshwaram has been built in a in a span of 2 3 years now there is lot of discussion about whether that investment was right whether uh, it was needed whether the level of investment that we make uh, is uh, good for the state whether it whether it is sustainable in the long run and all uh, there are only three four points that we need to keep in mind uh, when we do this kind of analysis one we could have implemented the same project over a span of 8 9 years okay it would they would it will it would have led to cost and time overruns okay but the cost of steel the cost of land acquisition all this would have also gone up the cost of cement and all that would have gone up so by investing uh, even if they are borrowed funds heavily in the initial first two three stages we have ensured that water reaches our uh, farms now if you look at the overall data the contribution of telangana to the national crop area has gone up by 1 percentage point since 2014 to okay the contribution of telangana's crop production is also gone up by 1 percentage point uh, at the all india level between 19 2014 and now okay our area under uh, our gross crop area has gone up by nearly 1 crore acres it was around 1.2 1.3 crore uh, acres now it, we are at 2.3 2.4 crore acres okay just as a matter of uh, record uh, mm, during the last vana kalam that is the, during the last karif the area under paddy in telangana was 62 lakh acres in ap it was 30 lakh acres okay now as we speak the area under paddy in telangana now is 56 lakh acres in ap it is 15 lakh acres Sir, this yeah. increase was it at the expense of forest or reclamation of dry lands it was reclamation we are not not at the exploration of forest forests are anyway covered by the uh, conservation of forest land it was basically by ensuring that water reaches our parked lands and we we could uh, do the uh, farmers could take up uh, cultivation the crops are yeah there has there has been some uh, reduction in uh, some crops uh, because paddy has that kind of a nature where it, it sowing windows are large the pest attacks we know the pest attacks better uh, control of diseases is better okay but uh, um, Basically, uh, we have brought more and more uh, area under uh, cultivation and also led to double cropping. You've got the number, right? 62 lakh areas, you said it started with that. Yeah, 62 lakh acres was the area sown under paddy during the last Karif. Last Karif. 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 Oh. Mm. Now it is Where around. I, er, last last Karif, Karif in Telangana was around 35. No, the second the second season of this year, that is yeah. the current season, yeah, current season, the Rabi, we are having around 56 lakh acres. 56 lakh. The Rabi is the smaller season, yeah. so the yeah. non rain. So yeah. from 60, yeah. that's 50, but Andhra is at 15. Karif largely and the tank irrigation also. Mm. Tank irrigation. See, and the then. Is largely through mm. or, uh, hey, the dam irrigation. Mm. Yeah. Major so irrigation or bore well. Groundwater exploitation. And Ravi crop will be mostly irrigated only. Yeah. Only. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no rain. No, even dry crops are there. No, he's talking about paddy. Paddy. Yeah. And Telangana. Very little. Very little. Most of, even in Kharifa, it's very little. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
getting connected on the villages. Most of the villages got connection, but that connection, electricity connection to the village, largely used for the irrigation purpose, not for the household connection. So that that time initially it started with shallow wells, and then then water started going and water deeper, deeper. dropping, and then started technology also available in 1990s and the advanced technology, borehole technology, then started we had our wells. Sorry. Yeah, no sure. Yeah. So, uh, so the bore, since bore wells are also a significant part of our, uh, uh, where farmers depend on irrigation, and as I said, power was an, was an issue. So when Telangana was formed, uh, farming sector used to get six hours of supply per day. Okay. And uh, that six hours of power supply also would not come continuously. It would be three hours in the mor morning, then three hours in, in the night, sometimes at the dead of the night. So, uh, sometime in 2018, we shifted to nine hours. And uh, 2016 or 17, we shifted to nine hours. And to, from 2018 onwards, Telangana is the only state in the country which gives 24 hour power supply to the agricultural system. It is the only state in the country which gives 24 hours power supply to the agricultural sector. In fact, to all sectors, to domestic and also industrial sector. Yeah. So, uh, this I think is a significant uh, in investment uh, as far as agricultural uh, sector is concerned. And this is primarily because of the increase in the production of electricity. It is also because of increase in production, but also because the production across the country has increased. So there is more production of power in the country than our capacity to consume. So market, we have, it, it is possible for us to purchase power also. Okay. So uh, if Telangana, why, Telang why is Telangana able to do it is because we have made those strategic investments in getting into uh, distribution system. distribution system and uh, Getting Initially, it was purchasing from neighboring states. Chhattisgarh, we had. Yeah, we have an agreement with Chhattisgarh. What is that line? Yeah. There is a strategic plan. Even Telangana government has invested in nine. And then our uh, our uh, investment in solar power has increased drastically over the last uh, eight nine years. We have gone up by some from 300 to some 3000 <coughs> megawatts of uh, capacity. So it is that kind of uh, thing that we now have uninterrupted power supply for all the sectors uh, in uh, Telangana. Now regarding uh, so this, from when we have started dealing this 2024 or uh, I think it is 2018. 18. I think it is first June or first October or something like that. 24 hours power supply. So, and as of now, we are the only state uh, in the country which gives 24 hour power supply to the agricultural sector. I suppose the downside of it would be depleting groundwater. Yeah. yeah. So, the groundwater, uh, groundwater, actually uh, groundwater is actually because increased of because, of, uh, because of the stabilization of tanks yes. and then you are getting water from the uh, rivers and all that. Mm -hmm. So, 